Uh, we've been busy before that uh, going through the book of Philippians. Remember we shared about the fact that God's called us to uh, get unstuck, how to get unstuck, how to come forth and how to move forward, how to be free, be set free and stay free. And it took us through the book of Philippians and I preached the first sermon on Philippians chapter 1. George Goulet, Pastor George Goulet from Durban, preached the second sermon, and then Mike Day shared with us uh, the third chapter of Philippians, and I'm going to close today on the book of Philippians, doing chapter four, and, and just kind of wrap it up for us this, this morning, and I trust that you're going to enjoy, enjoy it with us. Uh, I want to read us one or two scriptures now. Uh, I, wanna, I want to read us one or two scriptures, and then expand a little bit on it. And, uh, and the part that I want to focus on, on, on is Philippians chapter 4. Um, just allow me to go there. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, uh, where Paul says this to the Philippians. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with th thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Be anxious for nothing. And then he says in verse 7, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Paul is writing to the Philippians. He's wrapping this up. Now remember, he wrote this letter out of, from, uh, uh, out of jail at, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, Rome. Um, about 10 years after he planted this church, which was the first European church that Paul planted, that God called him to, to come to uh, Philippi, and he planted this church. It's a, it's a church that he loved so much. He wrote this letter to, to thank them for their participation, for their support and their encouragement in the gospel. He's also telling them uh, his state and condition that he's in since they've sent gifts once again to him through somebody and someone from the church. Church, and uh, and then to encourage them because they are going through their own share of persecution and difficulty as uh, as the religious people and the Romans uh, suppress oppress and uh, persecute them for their faith in Jesus Christ. And we, and we remember, I, I don't know whether you remember, and if you were not there with us, let me re remind you just quickly again. So Christ, chapter 1, Christ, our purpose. Chapter 2, Christ, our pattern. Chapter 3, Christ, our prize. Chapter 4, our power and our provision. So he starts off the letter in chapter 4, and I'm going to read to you from the Message Bible. He says, my dear friends, I love you so much. I, I do want the very best for you. You make me feel such joy, fill me with such pride, and don't waver, stay on track, steady in God. Then he says, I urge you, Euodia and Syntyche, to iron out their differences and make up. God doesn't want his children to hold grudges. Wow, that's interesting, isn't it? So even in those first church. Uh, that Paul planted, those very first churches, there were challenges. Even though people loved God, even though they were serving God, from time to time things would happen where people would misunderstand one another, disagree with one another, and that led to an opportunity of offense and division and, 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 a, and a, harm, a disharmony, a, a, a dividedness that causes tension and pressure. And Paul is writing to them and he says, listen, I want to encourage you. God doesn't want us to hold grudges and keep issues against, forgive one another. Make sure that as he forgave us, we forgive one another so that we can walk in forgiveness, restitution, and, uh, uh, and, and restoration so that we can demonstrate to the world that we are Christians, that we are people that as he forgave us, we forgive and that by our love one for uh, one another, we are the children of God. And so he encourages them. Uh, and then he says this, um, celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in him. Uh, in, in the old, in, in the um, King James, New King James version, it says, "Be uh, sorry, let me just get that's the wrong verse I've got here." Yeah? Verse four says, "Rejoice in the Lord 
always and again I say rejoice. Now remember Paul writes this letter and the thing that comes through very strongly he says because of the revelation that I carry of Jesus Christ and because of the way that he has conquered my heart I've come to a place of such freedom that whether I live or whether I die uh, I live my life unto Christ. So I don't really care what happens. At one stage he says, I don't know whether I should go to be with God or whether I should stay. I think I'm going to rather stay so I can help you to understand the gospel of the kingdom better, get to know Christ better so that you can live your life in freedom and fullness just like I did. And so Paul is saying, he says, therefore, when you know that truth, when you understand the beauty and the reality of who this Christ is, you live a life that is full of rejoicing, full of praise, full of thanksgiving all the time because Christ is the center. So he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. And then he says, of course, be anxious for nothing. Now, I want us to look at that just for a moment, just, just a short while, because you know what? With COVID-19 and all that has happened over the past few months since the beginning of the year to where we're at, and not just now, in general, we live in a time and an era where anxiety is an issue. I mean, you know what I'm talking about, you know? All of us, all of us, some or other time, in some way or form, struggle with some form of uncertainty, concerns that translate into some form of worry, that translates into some form of anxiety that ends up in a ridiculous fear if we don't watch it. And Paul is writing to the Philippians because somehow the threats that's happening, what people are saying, being thrown into jail, being persecuted, is causing them to feel uncertain about their future, uncertain about uh, life, uncertain about uh, whether they're going to make it or not, and get them to be anxious. And he's saying to them, now in the light of all that I've told you, remember now, Christ is our purpose, He's our pattern, He's our prize, and now that you know all of this, I want to say to you, He's also going to be your power and your provision. Therefore, be anxious for nothing. Now, it's, easily, it's easy to be said, but there are things in and around us that kind of pushes and pressurize us into a corner and wants us to be anxious and concerned. So let's just look for a moment, and I think one of the examples that we can use just to kind of back Paul up and what Paul has experienced is one of the champions in the Bible called King David. You know, King David was a mighty man, full of faith and confidence. We know that he was a lion slayer, uh, a bear slayer and a giant slayer. He, he was a young man full of confidence and faith. He's a young man that, um, that know how to conquer situations and circumstances. Yet David himself writes uh, in Psalms 139 and tells God about his anxieties. Now, if you go to Psalms 139, and let's just look at this for a moment. And so that we can determine what it is that makes us anxious and how do we deal with our anxiety. What do we do with it? Because Paul is writing to the Philippians and he's saying to them, regardless of your circumstance, your situation, remember now I want to say to you, be anxious for nothing. So in Psalms 139 verse 1, let's look at it for a moment um, and see what... Um, David is writing, he says, Oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. And I and are acquainted, acquainted with all my ways. And then he begins to speak about how God knows everything about him. It doesn't matter where he is, whether he's here there, wherever he might find himself in this world with his thoughts, with, with everything about God knows him inside out, upside down, because God created him. And he, and he talks about the fact that he was fearfully and wonderfully made and that God understands him and that he's special and that God cares about him. And so for, for, the, for the first few verses, 2 to verse 18, David speaks about this amazing God that loves him so much, that so carefully designed and made him in his image and likeness and cares about him. And then 
all of a sudden in verse 19 and verse 22, David starts speaking about those who don't love God, don't serve God, and are his enemies. And he begins to focus on the enemies. And he says, I hate those who hate you, and I hate those who sin, and I hate those that, that, that don't like me. And he says, God, why don't you just take them out and wipe them out? Now listen to this. And then in verse 23, he changes his tune. He changes how he looks at things and what he says. And we see that so often when we read uh, his Psalms. Uh, and we see that often uh, of the great Bible characters in the Bible. And then in, in verse 23, he changes his tune. He changes what he says from the enemies, the circumstances, and the situations out there of God, of himself, uh, of life. And then he says this. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me not and lead me in the way everlasting. In other words, David says something. You see, when we look at anxiety, when we look at about fear and worry, what it actually is is that we are more aware of what's happening around us. What people are doing around us, what they are saying about us, and what the situation is about us than what we are of God, His Word, and His promises. Can I say that again? You see, I, I want to say this to you before you condemn yourself and get into all kind of a negative mode and attitude. Uh, we all have got concerns and uncertainties in our lives. But your concern, my concern, can either be a platform that launches me into faith towards God, to believe Him, to, to believe, to put my confidence and my trust in God, to believe God, to adjust it, show me the way forward or the way out, or my concern can turn into a downward spiral of anxiousness, anxiety, or f and that becomes ultimate fear that leads to depression and oppression uh, and get us to a place of total defeat. And so we need to understand that. So, so, so David is saying, there are things out there. There are people saying things about me. There are people attacking me. There are people that want my life. There are circumstances that I'm not comfortable with. There are things that I don't like ha uh, at the moment that's happening in and around this world. Uh, there's just too many things that are affecting me. And when we begin to look at these things and focus on these things and listen to these things and begin to dwell on these things, they can become bigger than. They can become louder than. Those voices can become louder than the voice of God, than the image that we have of our God. Uh, we can look more to the situation and the circumstances and these things build up to completely overtake our lives and control and manipulate us. And, and that's what David is saying. He says, listen, I, I, I know that you're a good God. I, I know that you made me. I know that you know all about me. But somehow it's not God that took his eye off David. It's not God that stopped saying he has been... Uh, that he loves him and that he cares about him. It's David that begins to become more aware of his enemies and his circumstances. And therefore, he says, see, search me and see whether you find any anxiety in me. And that's what Paul's writing about. He says, listen, of course, there are some very real issues around us. All of us are facing some real issues, some concerns in our lives, concern maybe about your health, maybe about your family, maybe about your work situation concerning the future. Uh, how it's going to pan out and work out. And you're uncertain. But, 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 but Paul is saying this. He says, if you have carefully walked through this with me now and listened to what I've said to you, you would remember that, that I said to you, you know, because I've had that amazing encounter with God, and experience His amazing grace that saved me out of my circumstances and set me free from my bondages, I know I know that he so set me free, he so captivated my heart, that whether I come out of this thing or not out of this thing, he's my life, it's going to know him, it's whether I die or live. And Paul is saying, he says, when you understand that, you will not allow concern to become anxiety to the level where fear so grips you and it paralyzes you. And so he's saying, be anxious for nothing. David is saying, listen, Lord, I realize that I am 
looking away from where I'm supposed to look at. I'm looking away from the Jesus and more to the storm. And that's why I've got this sinking feeling, this uncertain feeling. And so for a moment, David is allowing, he says, I want you to seek and search me. And you know what? I want to suggest to you something this morning. I want to say to you, first of all, that as Paul is writing to the Philippians, he's not ignorant, nor does he ignore their situation totally. He says, I realize that you're suffering persecution. I realize there are tensions and pressures in and around you. Because remember now, I planted the church. I came to you to preach this good news to you. And remember, I was the one that, that, that when I ministered to you and, and people got delivered and set free, that we were thrown in jail. And at that time, you prayed for us and God set us free so that we didn't have to be anxious and worried because God was able to open up those jail doors, get us out. That God, that same God is able to do it again. And even if he never does it, we don't mind because our focus, our prize, our purpose is to know him, to be known by him and to live for him. And whether we live or die, it's gain. We're going to, and that's easier said than done. Paul is saying, you and I need to make sure that we've got that place, that intimacy, that understanding, that revelation of who Jesus is so that those things around us won't so easily beset us, affect us, or influence us. So David is writing, he says, Lord, search me. And that's one of the most or the greatest things that we can mostly do if we begin to feel and sense concerns that translate into anxiety to some levels of fear that wants to paralyze, is to say, Lord, Instead of trying, instead of looking at what is happening out there in circumstances, listening to what people are saying and seeing what happens around me, I want you to search me and show me why am I allowing that thing, that person, what I'm hearing to become so big in my life that it influences me to the point where anxiety grips me and fear grabs hold of me. Search me, God. Search my heart. Show me whether I have thought more about the circumstances. Listen carefully, because he says in verse 20, 23, he says, and show me, listen to what he says, and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, when I think a thought, and I keep on thinking the same thought for long enough, that thought forms a pattern and makes a way. Where Satan has got a highway or freeway, or that thought has got a freeway, highway into my life, and that's when people end up thinking of something constantly all the time. So a thought has become now a highway of thinking of thoughts coming in and out all the time of what if? What if that doesn't happen? What if they do that? What if they don't do that? What if they say, say this? What if they don't come anymore? What if that doesn't work out? And those one-off thoughts become a whole train of thoughts that becomes a highway of thoughts where Satan has now got a free way and free access to continually bombard our minds with the what-ifs of life with what if it doesn't happen. And those concerns becomes anxieties that becomes a stronghold of fear that oppress and suppress us and cause people to jump up in the middle of the night and can't sleep because they think of all these things. And, Paul, and David writes about it. He says, Lord, search me, O God, and know my heart. See, what's, is my heart truly anchored and set upon, upon you? Is my faith set upon you? Is my trust completely uh, set upon you and am I relying fully upon you or have I got my eye and my ear so turned towards circumstances people and what they say and what they do that it, those thoughts have become an influence into my life that have caused a massive anxiety and if it's there Lord then show me how to come out of it now how do we come out of it when Paul then writes to the Corinthians and he says to them uh, in verse 6 he says to them, I read out of the Message Bible, I like the way he says, in the, in the New King James, he says, don't, don't worry or be anxious for nothing. The, the Message Bible says, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. 
Aha. That's the first thing he says. He says, listen, don't worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praise shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. See, there's the word concerns. He says, it's okay if there are concerns, but don't let it become a downward spiral. Let it be the launching pad for your faith. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. And the King James Version says, and the peace of God, not the world's peace, not the comfort uh, and the encouragement that, that human beings give you, but the peace of God will settle in your heart and walk God between your head and your heart because he loves you. So, so Paul is saying, he says, listen, for you not to be anxious, you have to set your heart. Now, if you go and read, read uh, you set your heart and your mind, he says, if you want to walk in the, in the peace of God, and not be anxious. You have to set your heart and your mind on God and ask Him so that He can help you. So, so let's just look quickly before we close this morning on what it is that I need to do to make sure that I don't walk in anxiety. First of all, I want to say to you, you need to check what it is that you focus on. Because you see, what you focus on, in other words, what you listen to, what you watch, what you give yourself to, what you focus on, is what you will fill yourself with. Can I say that again? The media, the movies, the music, the conversation, the friendship circles that you're in, and the conversations that are made, if what you focus on is what you will fill yourself with. You will become full of doubt, unbelief, fear, anxiety, and people discuss these things and never talk about the answer side of things. They never give you the answer. They just always give you, I'm concerned about this, you know. I'm worried about this in the nation. I'm concerned when I look at the youth. I'm, I'm very uncertain about education. They tell you all the time, the news is filled with it. Uh, media is filled with it. Social media is filled with it. Cir friendship circles are discussing things and, and oftentimes seldom give the positive side or the answer side of it. And, and whatever it is that you focus on is what you would fill yourself with. And those thoughts, those ideas, those so-called facts will form a pathway, ultimately a highway of negativity that will begin to form certain thinking patterns that will get you to a place of anxiety and fear. Second thing that is important is you need to make sure who you hang with. You know, that's what Paul is writing about. He says, set your mind on Christ in Colossians. He says, set your mind on things that are above. If you go through the book of Philippians, you'll realize that from the beginning in, in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and also in chapter 3, Four, he speaks about, he said, stand with one mind in chapter 1. In chapter 2, he says, let us be like-minded. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Uh, he keeps on speaking about like-mindedness, a certain kind of a mindset. In Philippians 3, he says, count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge. He says, you need to get your mind on the knowledge of Christ so that you may know him. And then he says, you need to forget the things that are behind and press on towards the things that are ahead of you. So there's forgetting certain things and remembering other things. So Paul is saying, because he walks this through with the Philippians, he says, the reason why you are getting anxious is not because of the circumstances, the situations, and the people that are enemies out there. It is what you are allowing to come into your mind and what you end up thinking about all the time that becomes a pathway of negativity, oppression, depression, and anxiety that follows. So Paul is saying, he says, listen, I want you to make sure that you focus on the right thing because what you focus on is what you would fill yourself with. With number two, he says, uh, I want you to make sure that you are hanging with the right people. You know, it's an amazing thing 
There are certain people that I hang with and that I've spent my time with. I've got friends that that doesn't matter how difficult the circumstance nor the situation. I was with one of them just in this week who always says, and and they are going through their own challenges. Whenever you say to him, you know, this is a difficult situation, he says, there's always a way out. There's always a plan. And it's an amazing thing when you are around people like that, how easy... Or how much easier it is to change your tune, to add a little bit of, yes, I know, I just don't know that way yet. But, but, but because of their positivity, because of their angle on life, because of the point of entrance of choosing to be positive, choosing to believe that God can do the impo- impossible, there's always a way out. And being with those kind of people just give anxiety, fear, oppression and depression, less of an opportunity to lay hold of my life, my mind, and get me on the wrong track. Hanging with God frequently. That's why Paul encourages encounters with God. Now, encounters might not be being thrown off the horse every time like he was, but encounters mean those times alone where I bring my uncertainties. That's why he says in verse 6, he says, Be anxious for nothing but through prayer, communion, talking to God about your issues, telling him what it is that you're uncertain about so that he can remind you who he is, what he's done for you in and through Jesus on the cross, how he ultimately destroyed the forces of darkness and dealt with every principality and power, how the cattle on a th- thousand hills belong to him and that he will make a way where there seems to be no way so that when you get the perspective because you hang with God and you make known your issues, he can comfort you and encourage you so that concerns won't go further than what they are but become the launching pad of, fa- pad of faith. The third thing that is important is, you know, many times when I talk to people and listen to them concerning their concerns and their anxieties and their fears, I realize they don't always have all the facts together because Satan is a liar. And when we begin to get anxious, we forget sometimes to gather the facts. And I say to people, a lack of facts causes more confusion, especially when people start getting together and say, did you hear? Did you know? People say, I heard someone said, and because they don't have their facts, they cause more confusion because as people that are uninformed or not fully or correctly informed begin to discuss things, it becomes more confusing. The fact that people are then confused and don't have the facts causes people to be indecisive. Did you hear that? One of the factors, one of the uh, of the signs of people that are living in anxiety are people that are constantly indecisive and fearful and slow to make decisions. They are procrastinators. They'll say, no, I want to make sure. I want to make sure that I do the right thing. I want to be clear about what it is that I'm supposed to do. I want to know that I've heard God. But in the meantime, they're actually just living in confusion, indecisiveness, procrastination because of anxiety. And I want to say this to you, make sure that you get the facts so that you can, listen to this, apply the truth. See, Jesus says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I always say to people, as Christians, we don't deny the facts. We just got a greater reality. When we bring the facts, whatever it is, a financial issue that you have that is concerning you, get the facts, bring the facts to to the table, sit with somebody that knows what they're talking about and can help you and help you to apply the biblical truth to your situation so that you know that even though the situation is like Paul was in, the, in jail, he said, even though I'm in jail, I know that God can get me out of this because he's a good God, he's, a, he's able to. So that when you know the facts con- what, concerning what people say, what people are thinking, concerning the circumstance or the situation, when you have that gathered together, you can move from indecisiveness, confusion, and procrastination to quality decision-making because you are carrying the truth concerning God's word, what he says to you, and some good counsel. Last thing that I want to say to you is that once you know the facts and you know what the truth is, take it to God, hear what he says, get the right people around you, and then trust God. Listen, my friend, one of the things that Paul's writing about in the book of Philippians, he says, listen, when you get to know God, 
for who he is. For when you begin to press into knowing him, and that's the prize of your faith, to know him. To know him will produce such a level of confidence, faith, and trust in you that you will worry less about other things. You see, anxiety is a lie of the enemy to get us focused on everything else except God. Uh, there's a thousand things that we think about. There's a thousand things that we have to do. It, it sounds something like this. I just have to do this, then I can rest. I just need to finish this, then I can sit still and think. I, I just need to do that, then I can read my Bible. I just need to do this, then I can spend lots of time with God. And it gets you going with a thousand different things. And, and once you get to a place where you realize you are out of control and don't know what to do because you have not heard from God, and then by then struggle to trust Him, anxiety overtakes you and fear becomes the stronghold in your life. And I want to say to you, that's what Paul is saying. He says, listen, don't worry about everything. Don't be concerned about everything. First come to God because you know now that God is our price, God is our pattern, God is our purpose. And once you've surrendered your heart completely and totally to Him, then that's the one thing that you need to pursue. Time with Him, His truth concerning your circumstances, your situation, giving it to Him, hear what He says and obey Him, and then trust Him. And when you trust Him, He will do the rest. And then Paul says that he ends off this chapter by saying this. And scriptures or verses that we have entirely and at times totally misquoted. He says, he says, because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, that doesn't mean that if you could not play an instrument before that you can just quote that verse and now you'll be able to play an instrument. That's not what it means. That's a total misappropriation or understanding of that scripture it simply means this paul says this he says if you have been called by god and have responded to that call and are pursuing that call of god on your life if you are pressing into knowing him and following him in his ways then whatever god has called you for whatever god has called you to he will give you the power to do that because you'll be able to do all things through Christ that strengthens you. Whether you are finding yourself in an uncomfortable situation like Paul did in jail because he knew God, because he trusted him, because he completely relied upon him. They were sitting in jail singing songs and rejoicing in him because he was their price, their portion, and their focus. And God, he says, and people were amazed by it, that they were dumbstruck by the fact that we could be so joyful, so grateful, and so thankful, yet in spite of the fact that we were in, we were in jail, because by his power, we can do all things because he strengthens us. And then he says the second thing, he starts thanking them again. He says, thank you, Philippians, that you looked out for me. That at times when I'm struggling and I didn't have any uh, provision, that you sent once and again uh, for my, for my, towards me to aid me, to help me, to support me. Not because I'm in need, because he says, I've learned how to live in all kinds of circumstances. I know how to live in abundance, and I live, know how to live in need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then he says that, but I thank God that you gave because it was a sign, not because I'm so much in need, but it was a sign of the fruit of your life. It's a sign that you have been changed from selfishness, self-centeredness, and uh, to a people that are generous and kind. You've taken on the nature of your God, of your Father, who is a giver. He gave His Son, therefore you freely give of yourself and of your resources to support me. He says, and because you are so generous and because you are so kind, I also want you to know God will provide all your needs according to his riches and glory. So Paul is saying, listen, at the end of Philippians chapter 4, he says, now, finally, brethren, remember now to rejoice always in God because we have set our hearts and our minds to follow Jesus, 
to know Jesus, to live for Jesus, to fulfill the call and the purpose of Jesus in our lives. And it doesn't matter what happens. It's going to work out for the good for us because God's going to strengthen us. In jail, out of jail, in circumstances, out of circumstances, He's going to strengthen us to come through it by His grace. And, and to get there, even if you sometimes think you don't have the resources, the ability, the strength, He's going to supply all your needs according to His riches and glory because God calls you and when you and I respond to it, He enables you and He provides for you so that you could fulfill God's purposes in advancing His kingdom and preaching His good news to all that is lost. So don't give up. Rejoice in the Lord always. Be free, stay free, keep your eyes focused on Jesus and don't be anxious about anything because God will never leave you nor forsake you. He will always be there for you. Rather through prayer, good intimate chats with God, supplication, asking Him earnestly to help you, and with thanksgiving, because He's done it before, because He's a good God, because He's a good Father, and can do it again, trust Him and see what He will do, because He's a God of power and He's a God of provision. I trust that this has helped you, and I know we live in difficult times. So allow me to pray for you. If you don't know Jesus this morning, allow me to pray for you, and then there's somebody waiting for you, uh, just to pray with you. So put your hand up, press that button, and let them pray for you. But I want to pray for you first and say, Father, today I want to surrender my life. I don't want to live in anxiety. I don't want to live in fear. I don't want to look at people and circumstances and situation and try to work it out in my own mind because it becomes just one big highway of anxiety and fear. I want to surrender my heart to you. I want to ask you to become the Lord of my life. Lead and guide me in your righteousness. And... Uh, and show me the way to go. And, and then for you as a Christian, maybe you've come to a place where your concern has become an anxiety that has become such a worry that fear has overtaken you. And today, Father saying to you, turn back towards me. Look at me. Look at my face. Look me full in the face. And through prayer, let, 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 let your request be made known to you. And allow me to speak to you concerning the things that are so overwhelming you. And let me set you free, empower you and provide for you and take you out on the other side so that you can glorify my name. But remember, God loves you. We continue to pray for you. God loves you and stand strong.